This video discussion is about heavy metals and chelating agents, which are covered in chapters 86, 93, 95, and antidotes and depth chapters A28, 29, and 30 in Goldfrank's Toxicologic Emergencies. This is another video discussion where I'm redeploying material previously created for other groups of learners. In this case, it's from a presentation I created for medical students in their medical pharmacology course. In that course, all of the material in this lecture is from a single chapter in Katsung's Basic and Clinical Pharmacology, but your reading assignments for this course are from the Goldfranks textbook. It might seem like a lot, and it is, but I'll remind you that there are 13 Goldfranks chapters about other metals that we're completely skipping. You're welcome. All right then, let's get going. Well, this is going to be a pre-recorded lecture talking about heavy metals, toxicology, and chelating agents, and this corresponds to chapter 57 in the Katsung textbook. So the objectives of this session is that after studying the material related to this presentation, you should be able to describe the clinical and metabolic effects of intoxication with heavy metals. You should be able to define what is meant by the term chelation therapy, and be able to identify the drugs that are used in chelation therapy. So if you actually take a look at chapter 57 in the Katsung text, I actually happen to know the author here, Dr. Michael Kosnett. He is a toxicologist, and I see him at some of the toxicology meetings. And there's this little story here that comes from October 2011, where there's a six-year-old kid who's not doing well at school. And they eventually work up the kid and find out that there's lead intoxication because his father had been working at a plant that recycles lead batteries, and he was tracking the lead into the home. Now, the child had lead levels about 10 times normal, whereas the father had levels that were about 20 times normal. That's kind of interesting that they found problems in the child who had lower levels than in the adult. And we'll get back to this point later on in this same lecture, how children who are still developing are more prone to suffer the effects of lead toxicity. So if we're talking about heavy metals, which metals are heavy? Well, a whole bunch of them are heavy, but when we're talking about heavy metals in a medical context, generally we're talking about lead and mercury and arsenic, and that's kind of interesting because arsenic really isn't even a metal, it's a metalloid. But basically all of these elements have no physiologic function in the body. Ideally there would be none. There are always some low levels that are found, however. Now there are many other metals, however, of medical interest, but we're not really going to be talking about them much. Of course, there's the physiologic metals. These are very important, like sodium and potassium. There's some that are used therapeutically, like iron and lithium, and then several other non-physiologic metals that we're not going to be discussing here today. So we're going to start with lead, and its chemical symbol, as you know, is PV, which stands for plumbum. Latin for lead, and obviously where we get the word for plumbing, because lead is a very malleable metal and could be used in ancient times for plumbing. Now, lead is widely used in industry, say in batteries and in alloys and solder, and it has also been used in paint. It's mostly been taken out, but lead salts formerly were very common pigments in paint. And tetraethyl lead had previously been used as an anti knock compound in gasoline. We're going to be coming up to this topic later, but this is something which has generally been phased out. So what happens with lead in our body? There's multiple ways that we can absorb it, and the most common industrial exposure is the inhalation of lead dust. However, especially in children, absorption through the GI tract is more common, and unfortunately, children absorb more of what's ingested than adults do, up to about 50%, compared to adults absorbing only about 10 to 15%. And there are certain risk factors which would increase the amount of lead absorption. So basically, if you're malnourished to begin with and have low dietary calcium or iron deficiency or an empty stomach, if this kid is going around the house picking up these lead paint chips, they're going to be absorbing more than if they were an adult. Once lead is absorbed, it binds to red blood cells and then gets distributed throughout the body. And there's a multi-compartment clearance to the pharmacokinetics. So in the blood and in the soft tissue, it has a half-life of about one to two months, but it also deposits in the bone. And when it deposits in the bone, it has a half-life which is many years to decades. And in fact, if you go 
and look at adults, about 90% of their body burden is in the bone, but it's kind of physiologically quiet there, so that's okay. On the other hand, if that person's exposure to lead is then stopped, they still have this little bit of lead from their bone constantly leaching into their body, and it's very difficult to get that person's level down very, very low. So I mentioned before that lead is a component of bullets, and here we see this cross-section of a bullet right here. Here's the propellant, and then this gray part right in here is probably about 80 to 90 percent lead in some alloy. This happens to be a copper jacketed bullet right here. So if you get lead in your body, isn't that bad? Well, it's bad to be shot, yes, but if you actually have a retained bullet in soft tissue, as long as it hasn't injured a vital structure, it's generally benign. So if it's stuck in some muscle belly and isn't causing problems, it's probably going to be more hassle and more danger removing the bullet than just leaving it there. There's very, very low chance of developing chronic lead poisoning unless the bullet is in a joint or near bone or adjacent to cerebrospinal fluid. Bullets there are much more commonly associated with the development of lead poisoning. So what bad things does lead do in the body? Basically, it messes a lot of things up. There's multi-system toxic effects. There's multiple mechanisms of action. You can read about this in the textbook chapter if you like. Basically, there's a whole bunch of enzyme systems that get interfered with. You can develop neurotoxicity from lead, and the developing central nervous system is more susceptible. So therefore, young children or even fetuses are at highest risk. Now, there are a lot of toxins out there where you have to be exposed to a certain level of it, because below that, it's really not going to cause any effect. Unfortunately, there's been no demonstrable threshold, no effect level for lead. So even small amounts can cause problems. They just cause very smaller problems. Well, what is the problem that you get? Chronic exposure to lead in children is associated with a lower IQ. Now, as time has progressed throughout history, the definition of what a toxic lead level is has changed, not because humans have changed and the way that we, we react to lead has changed. It's just that now we're being exposed to a lot less lead than we used to before. So in the 1960s, the CDC defined a toxic lead level as greater than 60 micrograms per deciliter. Well, we've eliminated so many sources of lead that by the 1990s, you had to have a level of only 10 to be considered toxic simply because a lot of those people who had higher levels just aren't around anymore. And this is due to multiple environmental mitigation measures, which are working. So if children are more susceptible, then adults, of course, are less sensitive. And you can have, as an adult, chronic exposure to lead with a blood lead level around 10 to 30. And maybe you can detect some really subtle subclinical effects if you do special testing. But just routinely examining the person or talking to them, you're not going to notice. If you get levels up above 30, you can start seeing some neurocognitive effects like irritability, sleep disturbances, tremor, impaired coordination. And you can get, frankly, encephalopathic if your blood lead level is greater than 100. And then I also wanted to depict here one of the classic manifestations of lead peripheral neuropathy, which is a wrist drop. Now, in addition to the lead neurotoxicity, you can also get hemotoxicity. And this is usually manifested as an anemia, and that anemia can be normocytic or it can be microcytic and hypochromic. And that's the same kind of anemia that you can get from an iron deficiency anemia, which can put you at risk for lead toxicity, so which came first? Lead interferes with the synthesis of heme at multiple steps, as depicted in this figure over to the right. And I'm not going to go through all of those steps, but one of the effects of this is that you can detect elevated protoporphyrin levels in someone's serum if they have lead toxicity. Lead also increases the fragility of the red blood cells, so this can be associated with hemolysis. And then highlighted here in blues, because it's important, is basophilic stippling. Here is a red blood cell, but it's got all of these little spots all over it, basophilic stippling. And that is a very common clue on board questions that relate to lead toxicity. What about lead toxicity to other organs? It can cause damage to your kidneys, cause a nephropathy. This can decrease uric acid excretion, so therefore uric acid builds up and you can end up with gout. This used to be called Saturnine gout for a very complex 
reasons, because Saturn, the planet, was associated with lead. Each of the planets had an associated metal with it. So lead causes gout, and lead equals Saturn, Saturnine gout. It can cause reprotoxicity. It's associated with hypertension. And you can also get GI effects. You can get this recurrent abdominal pain, sometimes called lead colic. In addition, if you take a look on somebody's gingiva, you can see these gingiva lead lines. This little bit of discoloration right there is actually due to the deposition of lead sulfides. So as mentioned before, lead poisoning is much rarer than it used to be in previous decades. And in fact, blood lead levels fell about 90% in North America and Europe over the recent decades, so that the geometric mean nowadays is well below 10 micrograms per deciliter. And you will still see in books talking about organo lead poisoning. And what they're talking about is tetraethyl lead used to be added to gasoline as an anti knock compound. So you have all these cars burning the gasoline, just putting the lead in the air. Now that almost no cars on the road are using leaded gasoline anymore, that route of exposure is almost non existent. So, what happens if somebody has lead poisoning? Well, obviously, you would like to get the lead out. But the first thing is to terminate further exposure. Because if you don't terminate further exposure, it doesn't matter what else you do. But this implies that you have to determine what the source is first. Now, if the person is working at a plant that makes batteries out of lead, it's pretty easy to figure out what's going on. But if there's not an occupational ex exposure, it can be more difficult. In older homes, especially that uses leaded paint, the ingestion, usually by little kids, of paint chips is a common reason for this. This is much more common on the East Coast than the West Coast because they had all of those houses that were painted while lead paint was still around. There are some alternative health practices that involve various supplements that have heavy metals in them. And in fact, sometimes you can even get exposure to lead from toys and food and, and even candy. One particularly nasty way to get exposed uh, to lead in this way is types of food that are made out of dried red ground chilies, say like the spiced paprika or some tamarind candies that get coated with a little bit of red pepper. So if you're the farmer who's collecting all of these chili peppers, you collect them into burlap bags and you get paid by weight. So if you throw a couple of lead weights into the bag, then the bag weighs more and you get paid for it, then it goes to get processed, and they just throw it in this machine that chops it up, and the lead gets chopped up into the chilies as well. So after you've identified and terminated further exposure, the person will need supportive care. The primary way that we get rid of lead and other heavy metals is out in the urine, so you want to ensure adequate hydration, so you ensure adequate urine flow. And then in some selected cases, you can actually use chelating agents, which will enhance the urinary excretion of the lead or other heavy metal. Now, if someone is so lead poisoned they are encephalopathic, having altered mental status, say they've got cerebral edema or seizures, well, those need to be treated specifically. And you would want to give this person an intravenous agent, such as calcium disodium EDTA. Intramuscular dimer caprol may also be used in cases where someone is very encephalopathic. But you're not going to give these parenteral roots to someone who just has minimal symptoms. If someone is not encephalopathic, oral chelation therapy is going to be the treatment of choice. And the primary agent used in the treatment of lead toxicity is succimer, which goes by a couple of different names, DMSA, dimer captosuccinic acid, or the trade name Kement. So here's a chart showing the normal lead levels down here. We would like it to be as low as possible, but we don't call somebody toxic until they're above 10. But really, if you take a look at what the effects are going to be, they're going to be pretty subtle effects with neuro and hemotoxicity. And you don't start seeing, say, the lead colic and frank neuropathy and encephalopathy until you get to actually very, very high levels. So that's something to remember that you can have an elevated level outside of the normal range and not be significantly ill. And to summarize this discussion of lead toxicity, I wanted to briefly go over this case that appeared in New England Journal of Medicine. 
This was a 61-year-old man who had abdominal pain, lead colic for eight months. He'd worked at a lead smelter for 30 years, so figuring out what was wrong with him really wasn't all that difficult. On exam, he had this bluish discoloration of the gums, or Burton's lines, as I mentioned before. The blood lead level was highly elevated at 130 micrograms per deciliter, and he was moderately anemic with a hemoglobin of 11.5 grams per deciliter. And when you took a look at a peripheral smear, you saw that he had basophilic stippling. This guy was treated with calcium disodium EDTA plus DMPS, which we'll get to shortly, and his abdominal pain resolved. And three months later, his blood lead level was way down at 50 micrograms per deciliter. But even two years later, it had only gone down to 38 because he's got a lot of this still stored in his bones. And even if you clear out the soft tissues, he still has this repository that's going to constantly provide some additional exposure to lead, probably for the rest of his life. All right, on to arsenic. Arsenic has been used therapeutically in medicine, although pretty rarely. Salversan was a pre-penicillin antibiotic that contained arsenic in it. And there are some people who get their promyelocytic leukemia treated with arsenic trioxide currently. It's also found in various industries, like for semiconductors, used for wood preservatives, and in some pesticides, like these little devices that you stick into your yard that the ants take that contains arsenic. And also, a chemical warfare agent, lewisite, contained arsenic. And this will become important because we're going to be talking about the drug British anti lewisite Arsenic is also a major public health problem in Bangladesh. So Bangladesh is this country right here. And here's the Himalayas right up here. So there's all this water coming down through this country. And all of that water has heavy metal runoff from the Himalayas. Well, this hadn't been a problem until the 1970s when a number of people said, you know, there's a lot of people in Bangladesh who are getting various diarrheal diseases, fecal oral transmission diseases, because they're drinking water from surface water sources or very, very shallow wells. So they went in the 1970s and drilled these really deep tube wells to get very clean water. And it is very clean in the sense that it doesn't have microorganisms in it. It just happens to be water that contains a lot more of the heavy metals, especially arsenic and runoff from the Himalayas. So there's now this public health disaster with tens of millions of people in Bangladesh who are being chronically exposed to arsenic. So what happens with acute inorganic arsenic poisoning? Well, with any metal, you can get a rapid onset of gastroenteritis, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Then if you get exposed to enough, you can get cardiopulmonary effects and hemotoxicity effects and neurologic effects. It's pretty classic with severe arsenic poisoning to get this ascending sensory and motor peripheral neuropathy. In addition, in a delayed fashion, you can see these findings on the fingernails called Mies lines, these transverse lines of white across the nails. And really, that just indicates a period of decreased growth of the nails because the person was so systemically ill at one point in the past when they got exposed to the arsenic. Chronic arsenic poisoning can cause a number of constitutional symptoms like malaise and fatigue, possibly related to the associated anemia. They can also develop the peripheral neuropathy here. They develop these nasty looking skin lesions. This is taken from Bangladesh right here. And also chronic exposure will increase your risk of developing a couple of different kinds of cancer. Well, that's it for arsenic. Next, I'm going to be talking about mercury. HG, which stands for hydrargyrum, which is kind of combined Latin and Greek for water silver because it is a liquid metal at room temperature. There are a number of potential therapeutic uses for mercury, although most of these are obsolete. Thimerosal was a mercury-containing vaccine preservative. There is a topical antiseptic, which you still occasionally see people use, called mercurochrome. Calomel, until just a handful of decades ago, used to be used as a purgative or laxative. Here's some calomel right here. Someone was having constipation. You give this to them, and they get kind of a low-grade heavy metal gastroenteritis, and they'll just poop it out. And mercury is still commonly found in dental amalgam, although, contrary to what you might read on the internet, very, very little of it leaches out. So there's actually three different flavors, as it were, of mercury that we can be exposed to. There's the elemental mercury, liquid mercury, which is actually its least toxic form. In fact, it'd be really fun to play with 
you absorb very, very, very little of it, but what you don't want is it sitting around and vaporizing and then breathing in the vapors because you can actually absorb that through your lungs fairly well. But the kind of mercury that gives mercury its bad name as a poison are mercury salts. If you ingest these, it's corrosive. It can cause a hemorrhagic gastritis. It can bag your kidneys and you get acute tubular necrosis and renal failure. And then the third type of mercury are the organomercuries that primarily cause neurotoxicity. And you'll remember this from when I discussed Minamata Japan and the organomercuries to you previously. Mercury had previously been used a lot in the production of felt for hats. And so this character in Lewis Carroll's books of the Mad Hatter was actually representing a known occupational illness that hatters would go mad from chronic exposure to mercury in their line of work. And they would develop this peculiar kind of neuropsychiatric syndrome that was called erethism, where they would get kind of shy and withdraw and depressed and have explosive bursts of anger and blush uncontrollably. So the classic triad of chronic mercury toxicity are those neuropsychiatric disturbances, erethism, as well as some neurotoxic effects with tremor, and you can also get inflammation in your mouth with the gingivo stomatitis. There's another interesting kind of toxicity that's seen almost exclusively in children. Now, of course, this is rare because we're not exposed to mercury as often as we had been in decades past, but they can develop this painful erythema of the extremities, particularly on the hands and feet, called acrodynia. And this is associated with them being kind of irritable, some neurocognitive effects, as well as they sweat a lot, they've got diaphoresis, and they also have hypertension. And so it's actually kind of common for this very rare disease of acrodynia to get it confused with a pheochromocytoma because you have this kid who out of nowhere is diaphoretic and irritable and hypertensive and everybody thinks, oh, they just must be having a tumor of their adrenals producing too much adrenaline. Now you've almost definitely heard that there's mercury in fish. Absolutely, nearly all fish and shellfish contain trace amounts of mercury. And in fact, the primary source of mercury in our diet comes from fish and shellfish. But there are only a few species that actually contain enough mercury to actually be even a theoretical risk during neurodevelopment, which is to say a risk for young children eating a lot of fish or fetuses where the mother is eating a lot of fish that contains mercury. So therefore, pregnant or lactating women should avoid certain species of fish so as not to potentially cause these neurodevelopmental effects on their offspring. So there have been a number of epidemiologic studies trying to look at exposure to mercury from fish and shellfish. And they've gone to the Faroe Islands in the North Atlantic and the Seychelles in the Indian Ocean and looked at these populations who have near exclusive protein from seafood diets that have shown a correlation between having higher mercury levels and a lower IQ by a few points. So there is a small theoretical risk of eating a lot of fish might impair somebody's IQ, but this doesn't apply to men and it doesn't apply to non-pregnant or non-lactating women because these are adults. We've already finished our neurocognitive development. It's only those that are still developing where this can be a problem. So if you wanted to avoid the fish that have the highest mercury levels, you want to avoid the large predatory fish because the mercury has bioaccumulated in them. And so that would be shark, swordfish, king mackerel, and tilefish. If you want to look for fish and shellfish that commonly have very low mercury content, look over here on this list over here on the right, although albacore tuna tends to have slightly higher mercury levels than canned light tuna. All right, so now on to the chelation agents. Chelate actually means having pincher-like claws. So a chelating agent actually has multiple teeth or claws, typically atoms of oxygen, nitrogen, or sulfur that contribute electron pairs to complex a metallic cation ligand. So it's being chelated. It's stuck in claws from multiple different orientations. So how is it that chelating agents work? In general, heavy metals in the body bind to sulfhydryl groups and enzymes and inhibit those enzymes. So this metal ion of the heavy metal complexes with the electron pairs 
on the sulfur atom. But the chelating agents provide alternate binding sites, sometimes using sulfhydryl groups, that basically pulls the heavy metal ion from the enzymes that it's inhibiting, mobilizing it, and allowing for enhanced urinary excretion, assuming that the patient doesn't have underlying renal failure. So if you mobilize the heavy metal ions, you can actually redistribute them from a less dangerous body compartment, potentially to a more dangerous body compartment. That's something to look out for. So you give somebody a chelating agent and it mobilizes, say, all of the lead from the soft tissue, brings it into the blood, and you're just hoping that in the process that it doesn't get into the brain and cause a worse encephalopathy. Chelating agents are not super particular as to what metal they're going to bind, so they may chelate physiologically needed metals, so you have to follow the levels of several important electrolytes. And in addition, it's very difficult to remove the metal from compartments that have a very long half-life, as I mentioned before, like the bone. So here is a x-ray taken of a child. And you can tell that it's a child because there's these unfused growth plates at the end of the long bones. But in addition there, there's this other line of increased density right there. And that is an area where relatively more lead has been deposited into the bone. Okay, so finally I'm actually going to be talking about the drugs here, talking about the chelating agents. Here is a list of some of the names that you ought to know. And I think that recognizing these names and maybe recognizing the indications for them, that's the level of detail that you're probably going to need to know for your exams and clinically. So first drug, dimercaprol. This has another name of 2,3-dimercaptopropanol. And it is also called British anti lewisite or BAL. This was actually developed in the latter years of World War I because they wanted to have some sort of drug to use as an antidote for a chemical warfare agent called lewisite, which contained arsenic that was really bad, but was never actually used in wartime. Now, dimercaprol is prepared as a 10% solution in oil, because it's very fat-soluble, and you actually have to give it to somebody through an intramuscular injection, which I've heard are quite painful. So you only want to use this for the sickest patients because you have to weigh the benefit versus risks involved. So you might use dimercaprol for significant arsenic or inorganic mercury poisoning or severe lead poisoning. And in cases of severe lead poisoning, you'd probably be using it along with calcium disodium EDTA. I've already mentioned succimer before, also goes by the name DMSA. This is a water-soluble analog of the previous drug dimercaprol. It's typically given orally. It is available IV in some other countries, but not in the U.S. Now, in the United States, succimer is FDA approved to be used in kids who have a blood lead level of at least 45 micrograms per deciliter. Now, it can be used for adults. It's not specifically FDA approved, but you can certainly use drugs off-label. And on the other hand, what else are you going to use? Succimer is also used occasionally for arsenic or mercury toxicity. Some of the prominent side effects you need to know, it can cause some GI side effects, basically nausea, vomiting, can cause a rash, and in some people, increases their liver transaminase enzyme levels. Now here's ones I mentioned before, calcium disodium EDTA. This is an IV medication which is given primarily for significant lead toxicity because it has to be given parenterally. It could be used for some other metals or some other radionuclides. Now, unfortunately, there have been a few case reports of deaths in autistic children who were being chelated by an alternative care health practitioner who says, oh, the problem with your kid is that they have heavy metal, probably mercury toxicity. So I know that I can chelate them with EDTA, but you're supposed to chelate them with calcium disodium EDTA. But if instead you give them only the sodium EDTA, it will actually chelate your calcium and you can get very hypocalcemic and potentially die. Now here's another drug which is mentioned in the chapter, unithiol, or DMPS. This is one that got mentioned before in that earlier case of the lead smelter patient who got lead toxicity. It's actually not available in the United States. It can be used for any of the heavy metals. 
D-penicillamine is actually sometimes used in the United States. It's an alternate oral medication that can be used for lead or mercury, although succimer works better. It's also used in some cases of rheumatoid arthritis and can also be used to chelate copper in cases of Wilson's disease, which is a copper storage kind of problem. Potential adverse effects here are that it can cause hypersensitivity reactions and can cause some damage to the kidneys. So if you had to choose between D-penicillamine and succimer, basically you would choose succimer unless they couldn't tolerate.